Today we're going to talk about uh, Chapter 13, uh, Physical Health and uh, Culture. Uh, you would think that uh, health would be the same everywhere, but uh, the way it turns out, it's, it's not. So let's get started. Genetic variability in humans is considerably less than in many other species, given how recently modern humans emerged as a species. Uh, so no matter where somebody's from, genetically we are very, very similar. Uh, physically we may look a little bit different. Uh, and the only really, the only real physical difference seems to be skin tone. Uh, it seems to be somebody at some point decided that skin tone was ex was uh, was very important. Uh, there are other facial features, uh, body features that are different, but uh, that can be different. Uh, but for the most part, we're really, really close. Modern humans first emerged approximately 200,000 years ago, and they all lived in Africa until approximately 50 to 60,000 years ago when some of them migrated elsewhere. And of course, that's uh, where the, uh, the differences uh, started appearing uh, because it was cold, it was extremely cold. And in order for people to survive, they, they uh, became uh, paler and paler and paler. Um, and that's where <clears throat> uh, pale people came from, I guess. <laughs> Uh, there are really odd uh, differences between uh, one person and another. Uh, eye color is, is another one. Um, as, they, uh, as they migrated north with less sun, uh, they didn't need uh, the filter, the brown-eyed filter. So, they, uh, so blue eyes, there was a mutation of blue eyes, and which eventually... Uh, mutated to green and, and gray eyes uh, because it was it just wasn't needed. Uh, the reality is that people who have blue, gray, or, or green eyes uh, don't see as well in the sun, and people with brown eyes don't see as well at night. The the differences aren't that extreme, uh, but uh, there are differences, uh, and and the uh, blue eye mutation uh, occurred about ten thousand years ago. Uh, from uh, what people have uh, determined. So if you look at all the, the people in this picture, they, they don't look all that uh, different uh, in, in reality. Humans have become so dependent on cultural uh, information to survive that culture has become a selective force in their biological nature. <clears throat> Humans are said to be a product of culture gene uh, co-evolution as they have both evolved biological predispositions to depend on cultural information, and this cultural information enhances their fitness as it continues to evolve. And that's one of the reasons why uh, you living in uh, uh, the desert of, uh, of uh, Arizona and New Mexico uh, and uh, southern Utah, um, your, your cultural, your culture tells you to do select things, not to stay away from snakes, uh, to beware of uh, uh, coyotes that cross your path. <clears throat> Whereas my culture, which is a farming culture from uh, the Midwest, is is very much different. We don't we don't have poison snakes up here. Um, there are coyotes that have, have come this far north, <clears throat> but they aren't a danger because they're so the the um, uh, Packs are so small, but in of course in uh, in the desert they're they're much larger. A common domain in, in uh, and and of course uh, lactose intolerance is, is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, if you are you come from a, a group of people that evolved uh, with cattle with uh, with milk, uh, then milk became a staple for you cheese, milk, cheese, um, and, and whatnot. And so you, you, didn't, you developed uh, the ability to uh, process lactose, um, <clears throat> to, to produce lactose, uh, and, uh, and use the, the milk for, for the rest of your life as a, as a food source. Uh, but, of course, there are a lot of people that are lactose intolerant, and of course, they were the ones that evolved 
uh, away from uh, away from cattle. A common domain in which we see evidence for this selection is cultural differences in dietary practices such as milk consumption. Different cultures vary in what they regularly eat, and, and long-term persistent changes in dietary practices have been accompanied by genetic evolution that maximizes the effectiveness of the nutrition that people derive from their diets. And one of the things that we know, one of the things that we understand now, <clears throat> is that... Uh, is that uh, people are we we are full of bacteria, uh, and the bacteria uh, allow us to be who we are. It allows us to uh, to process the foods that we process. Uh, if we process a lot of sugar, um, it, and it's one of the reasons why um, indigenous people uh, who didn't evolve around sugar, why they are 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 more sensitive to sugar. Uh, it's you know, it makes a lot of sense. All of this has to do with your culture and what you eat. Um, if you go to um, uh, South America, um, when we, we went down there uh, for a, a Fulbright trip, and one of the things that they talked about were peppers, uh, the hot peppers. There are all degrees of, of pepper that they grew in the Inca Empire. And you can see it, uh, they, they had terraced mountains and on those terraces, they grew, they grew food. They grew mostly potatoes. And, and actually, if you go down to South America, they have, they have uh, 50 to 100 uh, varieties of potato. Uh, why? That's where potatoes came from. They came from that area of, uh, of South America. Um, so they evolved eating all of these foods, the peppers and the potatoes, and, and that's the way their bodies uh, evolved, eating select foods. If you go to the uh, Kalahari Desert, <clears throat> there are people in the Kalahari Desert uh, that have lived there for, for eons, and these individuals will eat anything that's edible. Uh, they'll eat termites, they eat uh, melons that are very, very bitter, uh, and, and their bodies have adjusted, have evolved to process those foods. Um, as humans, we can't eat bark uh, off of trees because there's no, it's, it's mostly cellulose and we don't break down cellulose and hardly at all. Uh, but you know deer can eat uh, can eat cellulose. they can eat bark. Uh, so we as different individuals have evolved eating different things. We have bacteria in our system that breaks down those things. And it's one of the problems that indigenous people had when they started getting food from, uh, from Europeans, from Westerners, uh, because the food that the Westerners ate didn't, uh, was not even anywhere close to what had been, eat, had been eaten before. Uh, so the, uh, the buffalo uh, hunting tribes uh, in the plains, uh, when they forced them to, uh, uh, when they forced them to, uh, on, onto reservations, um, instead of eating the, the very uh, lean uh, buffalo meat or, or venison uh, from the deer and the um, uh, pronghorned uh, sheep, pronghorned antelope, I'm sorry, pronghorned antelope, <clears throat> when they started eating the fattier uh, uh, beef cows, uh, of course, there, there was too much fat, and of course, it it created a problem because they weren't used to that much fat. And of course the sugar was a problem, the oatmeal was a problem, the grains that they gave them to eat, uh, it just didn't fit in, in what they had eaten before. And it, uh, and people are still adjusting. Uh, you know, it's only been a couple hundred years uh, that they have been forced to eat uh, a different diet. And um, things haven't evolved as well. Or things haven't changed uh, uh, completely in, in order to process those foods. <clears throat> Humans vary in the amount of starch that they eat. In general, people in agricultural societies consume more starch than those in most foraging societies. And this, of course, was a problem uh, for the indigenous peoples. 
And the people from cultures in which a lot of starch has traditionally been consumed are more likely to have a genetic mutation that increases the amount of amylase protein in their saliva, which helps to digest starch. Uh, so Europeans who, who ate a lot of starchy foods, uh, mostly because they wouldn't uh, uh, allow them to eat meat, uh, the peasants of, of Europe weren't allowed to eat meat. Uh, so they had to eat a lot of vegetables, and from the vegetables they needed to get as many calories as possible. Uh, so they ate a lot of they ate a lot of starchy foods. Uh, they ate onions. They ate uh, potatoes when they came over from the Americas, um, and and it uh, it helped uh, people survive. Uh, in in the Americas where there was a lot of game, um, the, the people ate a lot of meat, and that is the difference between. The, the peasant of, of Europe and the, uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Uh, the indigenous people of the Americas had, had lots of meat, as you can see from this picture. This guy's got a turkey. This guy's got, uh, looks like a squirrel, maybe. Uh, they process meat. They ate buffalo. They ate a lot of venison. Um, so they ate a lot of meat, but they didn't have a lot of starchy foods. They did have potatoes, but that was in, in South America. Uh, in North America, not so much. In West Africa, they had, they had corn. Uh, they had tomatoes. Um, they had foods that, uh, that people hadn't seen uh, in, in Europe. In West Africa, populations of Kwa-speaking farmers uh, started to grow yam crops, which required them to clear the forests. <clears throat> One inadvertent uh, side effect of this cultural practice was that it increased the amount of standing water after a rain, creating a better habitat for malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Malaria then spread in those regions and led to the evolution of a particular genetic vari variant for hemoglobin that is associated with sickle cell anemia, which has the benefit of making one more resistant to developing malaria. And, of course, that needed to happen because malaria was wiping out whole populations. Researchers around the world have attempted to identify different genetic variables that might lead to social sensitivity. 5-HTTLPRA118G and MAOA are alleles that, uh, that have been found in Asian samples, but not in European samples. Uh, could they have something to do with uh, social sensitivity? Uh, because uh, uh, Asians are more socially sensitive than certainly than the Europeans. A uh, genetic variant that is associated with increased emotional support seeking in times of distress for European Americans is associated with decreased emotional support seeking among Koreans. A variant that is associated with increased attention to foreg uh, foreground objects among European Americans showed the opposite effect among Koreans. A variant that leads to better responses to antidepressants among Caucasians leads to worse responses among Koreans and Japanese. A variant associated, and, and actually uh, just yesterday, the APA came out with an apology, um, uh, an apology to uh, the, the world. Uh, they said that they were, they had uh, developed their psychological mindset uh, to uh, see uh, Western Western man Caucasians as the um, as the staple as the basis uh, of all of their uh, psychological thought, <clears throat> so they apologize for being racist and for for supporting systemic racism. Uh, there have been times in the past where they uh, graded people by whether they how intelligent they were. And, of course, this is something that uh, should never have been done. Uh, but the APA has apologized for supporting systemic racism. And the reality is that some drugs that work on ca Caucasians don't work, on other, don't work as well on other individuals. And one of them is Prozac. One of them is uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Works fairly well with Caucasians. Doesn't work as well with the Europe, with uh, with Asians and uh, other indigenous peoples, um, and and of course this is something that need, needed to be looked at. One of the odd things that has come out of the COVID um, uh, crisis, the COVID uh, pandemic, 
is that we are noticing that there are select groups of individuals who do not, who are more sensitive to uh, respiratory infections. And those people are people who have type A blood. Now we've known this in the past, but nobody wanted to say anything because they were afraid of insulting people. Uh, we, had, we knew that uh, people with type A blood uh, had a, uh, an immune system that overreacted to uh, infections and a lot of times it was controlling that uh, overreaction uh, that uh, that led to uh, some from some very select problems now the, of course type a blood is is in caucasians it's in uh, indigenous peoples it's in african americans uh, but uh, type a people <laughs> type a blood is more prevalent uh, percentage-wise uh, in uh, in minorities than it is in the uh, in uh, Caucasians and Western uh, people. Um, as it turns out, uh, the the uh, majority of people who are Caucasian are type O blood have type O blood, and type O blood doesn't react as negatively to uh, uh, to uh, to COVID. Uh, one of the things we noticed right away, almost right away, was that uh, COVID seemed to be um, uh, very difficult to deal with for, for African Americans. And one of the reasons, and the group that we are dealing with, or the, the group that was having problems, uh, were the individuals who had type, type A blood. Now, my daughter has type A blood. Uh, I think my son is type O, but uh, my daughter is type A. So... If she ever catches COVID, uh, she's more likely to have a, an extreme reaction. It's, it's really kind of interesting. She uh, uh, she has bronchitis, and anytime uh, she gets uh, tries to run in the cold uh, or or is is outside too long and swallows too much cold air, she develops bronchitis, which is an overreaction to uh, to to uh, stimulation uh, of her bronchii. So there you go. This is this is something that uh, we have known for a while, but we didn't want to say anything because it seemed like we were saying that this this group is weaker than this group. Uh, so we didn't say that. But now we know that there are uh, genetic differences between people that cause some individuals uh, to have more problems than others. Now we've always known we've always known about sickle cell. Well, we've known for a long time about sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia only ap happens uh, with uh, individuals. Uh, it's, it's very rare uh, for it to uh, surface uh, in somebody who is not uh, of African descent. Uh, and we have talked about that. Uh, there's another one, Cooley's anemia, anemia, that only happens to Southern uh, Mediterranean uh, people. Uh, southern Mediterranean people, or Mediterranean people that live around the Mediterranean area. That's that would be Italians, uh, people from Spain, people from North Africa uh, have uh, have a, a, a um, uh, genetic proclivity for what is called Cooley's anemia. Uh, people from Greece, and actually, I've run into to people with Cooley's anemia before. It's it's similar to sickle cell anemia. Uh, but it's it's caused by um, well it's it's a genetic flaw that uh, that makes the individual anemic and uh, there's not a lot you can do do about it just like sickle cell anemia we haven't figured it out yet a variant associated with decreased emotion suppression among European Americans predicted uh, increased emotional expression among Koreans so we're we're seeing the same genetic uh, aspect. Uh, that is causing opposite effects uh, between Caucasians and Koreans. So if, uh, if a Caucasian was married to a Korean and they ate food that made him feel good, potentially it would make her feel bad. Uh, if they ate food that make him, made him more emotional, more emotional, it would make her less emotional, uh, as interesting as that is. And, of course, uh, it all depends on... on all kinds of interesting things. Studies that included a sample of Korean Americans who were genetically more similar to Koreans, but cl culturally more similar to a European Americans, showed a pattern of results that were more similar to those of European Americans, demonstrating that cultural experiences can actually shape 
how genes are expressed in the body. And a lot of this has to do with the food that we eat and the bacteria that we have in our systems. Uh, if, we are, if we eat um, in uh, Korea, they eat a lot of kimchi. Uh, they eat a lot of fermented, it's fermented cabbage with spices. Uh, and one of the spices is garlic. <clears throat> they eat a lot of rice. Uh, as Americans, as European Americans, uh, European Americans don't eat a lot of rice. Uh, our, our starchy staple is uh, usually potatoes, french fries, uh, mashed potatoes, uh, whatever. Uh, but we eat potatoes. So if you were a Korean living in the United States, you would probably eat a, uh, a more a, a European-based uh, diet, which would mean you would eat more potatoes than rice, potentially. And that, sh that could potentially change all of these the structures inside your body. It would uh, force your genes to express themselves so that you could survive in that environment. Uh, people that go overseas, and I've been overseas, uh, that try to eat a, the, a diet similar to the people uh, that, that uh, where they're going, uh, a lot of times they'll develop uh, in, uh, uh, digestive problems. This is what happens a lot of times when uh, people from the United States go down to Mexico and they start eating the cuisine. Uh, there are bacteria down there. Uh, we went to, uh, like I said, we uh, took a Fulbright trip down to South and, and Central America. We visited Peru and we visited uh, Guatemala. And when we were in Guatemala, almost everybody got sick. And one of the reasons they got sick was because of a parasite. Now, you know, the parasite is endemic as far as the Guatemalans are concerned. Uh, it's in their food and they are able to... Uh, not develop a problem with it uh, but because we were and it was uh, the interesting thing was that I was with a group of uh, uh, of American Indians who were very genetically they were very similar to the people living in Guatemala they're, they're mostly uh, of Mayan descent uh, so they're very similar far more similar than I was uh, but they became just as sick as I did um, so uh, it was really kind of interesting. Uh, it was in the meat, uh, and those of us, the people that were ate a vegetarian uh, diet, uh, those individuals did get sick. But strangely enough, one of the individuals on the uh, on the trip <clears throat> had developed the same um, problem, the same parasite. He had uh, contracted the same parasite uh, from eating fruit from Guatemala or from Nicaragua, actually. <clears throat> and he was just getting over his, uh, his problem. Um, and uh, he, was, he was a European-American. Um, but uh, he was just getting over his problem when we all contracted it down in Guatemala. Or not all of us. Uh, the people that uh, ate the chicken got sick, and the people that ate whatever else they had, uh, and I can't remember what, a, what, what the other food was, but we, those of us who ate the chicken, uh, all got sick, uh, whether they were indigenous, uh, whether they were American Indians, or whether they were European Americans. Really kind of curious. Of course, we all, most of us lived in the northern tier. Uh, they were from Montana, Idaho, uh, Washington State, uh, North, and North Dakota, and Wisconsin. Interesting group. Uh, Dutchman average uh, six six foot one, which is three inches taller than the average American man who stands at just under five foot ten. In 1865, American men averaged five foot eight, uh, which was three inches taller than the average Dutchman at the time. In the late 19th century, on average, Americans were among the tallest in the world, reflecting their relative advantage in income. Their gross national product per capita was the third highest in the world. Uh, at the time, American men stood one inch taller than Britons, uh, the same height as Australians, two inches taller than Norwegians, three inches taller than the French, four inches taller than Italians, and more than seven inches taller than the Japanese. And this was in the 19th century. Uh, so when World War I started, uh, all of these people came together to fight. And one of the things that uh, people noticed was that Americans were, were like the, Americans and Australians were the biggest people on the battlefield. 
uh, and that was because of their uh, the food that they ate. They ate a lot of meat. They uh, had a lot of dairy products. Uh, they ate eggs. Uh, they grew up on farms. Uh, so they were big, strapping people. Um, and of course, uh, when they're when you're looking for a large person, uh, sometimes you will would go out to the uh, to the country, uh, and you would say, "Oh, this is a, one of those corn-fed uh, uh, farm boys." And the reality was, why why was he larger than everybody else? He was larger than everybody else because he ate uh, meat. Uh, he had meat from the farm. He had lots of vegetables. He had a lot of starches uh, because they grew potatoes on his on his farm. They had corn. Uh, they had all the dairy products he needed. And of course, they raised chickens, and so he had eggs for breakfast and uh, ate meat for for every meal. Uh, so he grew larger. South Korean children are about five inches taller than their North Korean counterparts. Japanese immigrants to California in the 1950s were about five inches taller than their compatriots in Japan. Dairy consumption in particular has been linked to height. And these are people from uh, the United... These are Japanese Americans from uh, the United States. These are Japanese Americans from uh, Japan. Uh, I was really curious during World War II, um, the, uh, the individuals who went off to fight in the South Pacific uh, they found the Japanese much, much shorter than they were. They were so much, they were like five or six inches shorter than they were. So uh, it was it was really kind of a, a, an interesting uh, concept. You had all of these really big Americans, and you had all these really tiny, short uh, Japanese people. Uh, so after the war, when uh, the United States occupied Japan, one of, the th one of the things that they noticed, of course, was the fact that the Japanese people were so small. Now, I have been to Japan. I'm not a very tall person. I'm only about five foot six. Uh, but when I was in Japan, I was about the average height of uh, the Japanese people. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I fit in my Mazda Miata so well, is because uh, the Mazda Miata was developed for in, in Japan by the Japanese for the Japanese. And the cockpit that you sit in is a lot smaller uh, than most of the cockpits in the United from the United States in the United States. Uh, so I fit in that cockpit without any problem, and uh, if uh, because I'm about the same height as, as somebody that's Japanese. Now I've had people that were you know six foot five, six foot uh, two. They don't really fit in my car. Uh, they're just too big. Uh, they're too tall. Uh, I was I was carrying. <laughs> I offered this guy a ride one time. We were driving about 25 miles, and uh, he I, he lived in in a, a town right beside mine, and we were we both worked at Fort Belknap. So I offered him a ride. Uh, I had to put the top down. He was he was so tall he could, he couldn't even scrunch down and and be small enough to ride in my car. So I had to put the top down and. Uh, uh, he had about two or three inches that that uh, uh, kept getting blown in the wind. Luckily, it was it was summertime, so we were both okay. Japanese and Korean adults uh, report sleeping about an hour less per day than French adults do. Moreover, these cultures diff cultural differences are not just evident among adults. A systematic study of infants and toddlers in 17 countries around the world found that the Japanese infants sleep about one and a half hours less than North American infants. <clears throat> infants from Asian family, uh, countries were found to sleep much less than infants from Western countries. Dutch infants were found to sleep about 1.3 hours more than American infants. Uh, people in countries at the extreme of the sleep spectrum, Japan and the Netherlands, have a pronounced difference in the amount that they sleep. Japanese, European Canadians, and Asian Canadians were provided biometric measurements to measure their sleep. Japanese participants slept about 1.2 hours less than two Canadian samples. Asian Canadians slept uh, similarly to European Canadians, uh, showing that it is cultural. And where does the culture come from? Well, potentially it comes from the diet. And here you have a Canadian <laughs> who has all these people sleeping around him, and he's acting like he's putting them to sleep. 
Uh, Japanese participants indicated that their ideal amount of sleep was about uh, an hour less than that reported by Canadians. The Canadians described themselves as feeling more tired during the day, even though they were sleeping more than the Japanese. Until recently, socioeconomic status was invisible to health researchers. <clears throat> Research in 1984 of English civil servants were divided into four class uh, categories. The researchers found that compared with top administrators, the members of the executive class were 60% more likely to die over the 10-year period. The clerical staff was 120% more likely to die, and the unskilled laborers were 170% more likely to die. Now, why in the world would all of these tiers of, of people, why in the world would some people die more uh, readily than others? That was the question. This was in 1984, England. Despite the fact that these are very large differences, they have been replicated in many industrialized countries. It is actually larger than smokers and non-smokers. So if you're, if you're from a lower socioeconomic status, you're going to die younger than if you were from a, a very wealthy tier. If you're a millionaire in the United States, you'll live longer than somebody like me who only makes about $55,000 a year. The same thing was observed in Denmark. So this isn't just, this, isn't, this is found all over the world. The same thing was found in Denmark. The richer people lived longer than the poorer people. The same thing was observed in Norway. The same thing was observed in Finland. The same thing was observed in France. The same thing was observed in Japan. The same thing was observed in New Zealand. <clears throat> now, the reason I've showed policemen is because we're talking about civil servants here. And so I thought I would show civil servants. In the United States, almost every increase in income uh, reduces mortality rates, and these differences emerge even among those incomes that are uh, that are at the highest level. So, the most money, the more money that you make, the longer that you will live. And this shows the same thing. What are we talking about? Annual death rates between shown between 1992 and two, 2010 for individuals ages 50 to 74. The rates equal to the mortality rate of each income group uh, divided by the mortality rate for the entire age group. And we're talking about men and women. If the rate exceeds one, people in that income group are more likely to die than the overall uh, population. So we're talking about income groups. High incomes are, are these guys down here, or are these guys right here, and then we are looking at poor and poor. These are the low-income people, as you can see. They're more likely to die, both men and women. The Fulani, Mosi, and Remabe uh, all live in uh, northeast Burkina Faso. This is Burkina Faso right here. It's one of those countries that very few people have heard of because it's in West Africa. The region is endemic with malaria, which is a major cause of death in the area. The Mosi and the Remabe have uh, been living in this uh, region for thousands of years and have developed much genetic resistance to malaria over time. So these two groups are okay. The Fulani, on the other hand, are the people that invaded and took over. The Fulani moved to this region in the early 19th century as part of the Islamic invasion of sub-Saharan Africa. The Fulani have not developed much genetic resistance to malaria. The Fulani are the dominant ethnic group in this area. They kicked out as many of the peop other people as they could. When the Fulani first arrived, they conquered, enslaved, and decultured the other ethnic groups in the area, including the Mosai and the Romabe. Uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing this, this, this name, and I apologize for that. I, I should have looked it up and figured out how to pronounce it. The higher status that uh, they have as conquerors uh, appears to provide them with enough health benefits uh, to more than make up for their genetic vulnerability to malaria. Your health may be seriously compromised, and, and it's because they're, they're wealthier. They're the ones that conquered everybody else. 
uh, they live at just as long as uh, the other two groups. Your health may be seriously compromised if you don't have enough money to pay for adequate health care. In the British Civil Servants uh, study, all the workers had the same access to state-provided health care, yet there were still pronounced differences. <clears throat> it could be food. It gotta be, it's got to be something. People lower in socioeconomic status are more likely to have uh, jobs that place them in hazardous situations, such as having to deal with poisonous toxins that make them vulnerable to workplace accidents. And, of course, uh, this can be seen in uh, the uh, uh, uranium miners uh, from the Navajo Reservation, from the coal miners um, uh, in uh, the Black Mesa area. People in the lower socioeconomic status groups are more likely to smoke, eat a poor diet, and are less likely to exercise. And of course, if you've ever been to uh, the gas station in uh, Salee uh, and, and found your lunch uh, with that deep fat fried uh, food that they, they serve over there, uh, you know, that's, uh, or you eat potato chips or you eat Little Debbie's, um, yeah, you know, if that's the, uh, the, the food that you can afford to buy, uh, that you'll buy the cheaper food, uh, even canned food. The <clears throat> cheaper canned food has more salt and sugar in it than uh, other uh, cans, the, the more expensive canned food, uh, like canned green beans. Uh, it has more ends rather than the middles of the, of the green bean uh, so that you get less of the, of the food that you think that you're, you're getting. Even though the cans are the same size, uh, the cheaper can has more sugar and more salt in it, <clears throat> and it has uh, less gr actual green bean structure. Uh, you find a lot more in ends, uh, which you can't really eat because they're too hard. They're made out of cellulose. <clears throat> but uh, if you get uh, French cut green beans, uh, you don't get any ends. If you um, uh, middle cut bacon, you know my my wife. Has uh, has decided that we uh, we can eat bacon, uh, but it has to be center cut bacon because that is the leanest uh, uh, cut of the bacon. So we're now we eat uh, center cut bacon, which is costing you know, a dollar fifty more. It's like buying the expensive uh, gasoline. Chronically stressed people are more likely to engage in health compromising behaviors such as smoking and drinking in order to cope with the difficulties in their lives and stress directly weakens the immune system's ability to fight off infections and manage other threats. So if you're poor, you're under more stress. If you're under more stress, you're more likely to do something that will weaken your immune system. Even the stress itself will weaken your immune system and you're more likely to get sick. <clears throat> People who feel that they have not, uh, they do not have much control uh, in their jobs tend to have a higher risk of heart disease. Uh, low levels of control are, are more generally associated with poor physical functioning and an increased likelihood of illness. One study by Lockman and Weaver in 1998 found that though lower, although lower socioeconomic uh, status people have worse health outcomes, those with lower socioeconomic status who felt that they had much control uh, in their lives had levels of health and well-being that were comparable with those in higher income groups. So it's a feeling that you have control. If you feel like you have no control over what's going to happen to you, you're more likely to get sick. It creates stress. The stress uh, weakens your immune system. You're more likely to get sick. Stress and feelings of lack of control tend to be more pronounced among those who occupy a subordinate position and are subject to the demands of those who are able to make decisions for them. This is not just true of humans. Research with various primates has revealed that those individuals who are subordinate to a hierarchy uh, experience greater stress, stress hormone levels when the society is ruled by intimidation, as in chimpanzees. These are chimpanzees, of course, and this is the cowed individual and this is the one trying to intimidate him. 
The high stress hormones are especially true when subordinate primates are unable to, to easily avoid dominant individuals and when they have low availability of social support. The societal features that result in the greatest degree of stress among subordinates in various primate populations are remarkably similar to the situation in which many low socioeconomic status people find themselves in modernized industrialized societies. Feeling poor can matter as much as actually being poor. The experience of relative deprivation of knowing that others are doing better than you might lead to stress and its associated negative health consequences. There is a clear, and these ladies are drinking champagne out of the bottle. Okay, they're supposed to be wealthy people drinking champagne out of the bottle. That's Cristal right there. That's a $300 bottle of champagne. There is a clear relation between the absolute wealth of a nation and the average life expectancy of its citizens. This is true up to a, a gross domestic product per capita figure uh, of approximately $30,000 per year. After that, it kind of levels off. Above the per capita GDP $30,000, the curve largely flattens out, suggesting very little relation between absolute wealth and life expectancy. Many of the countries in the flat part of the curve have average incomes that are lower than that of the lowest Americans. Yet these people don't seem to be worse off in terms of health, health outcomes. Poor Americans are doing far worse than wealthier Americans. Income and, and health is actually a relationship between health and one's income relative to those around you. So if you live in a poor, uh, a poor neighborhood, uh, the people that are the richest people in the poor neighborhood are going to live longer than the people that are uh, the poorer people in that neighborhood. If you live in a wealthy neighborhood and you are one of the poorer people in that neighborhood, you're more likely to not live as long as the people in the poor, the, the, the wealthier people in the poor neighborhood, even though you make more money than they do. We compare ourselves with the people around us. So if you live in a wealthy neighborhood, then by comparison, you're poor, and that makes you feel subordinate, and that lowers your, your immune system, and that makes you more likely to die young. Indians living in the poor province of Kerala have uh, far lower absolute incomes than poorer African Americans in the United States. However, people in Kerala outlive African Americans by a substantial degree. The Kralians are poor in absolute terms, but they likely feel less poor because nearly everyone around them is poor. Poor Americans often earn an income that is not that poor by international standards. However, they are poor compared to their fellow Americans, and their health suffers accordingly. Disadvantaged minorities around the world tend to be of lower socioeconomic status, and they often experience worse health outcomes than those of major uh, majority uh, members. In particular, African Americans in the United States suffer from relatively worse health outcomes. Looking at the 15 leading causes of death in the United States, African Americans have higher death rates than that of Europeans, uh, of European Americans for 12 of them. African Americans tend to be of much lower socioeconomic status than European Americans. Many of the reasons for their higher mortality can likely be explained by the socioeconomic status difference. Respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's disease, and suicide are the three that they uh, are the three that is not uh, is higher for European Americans respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's disease, and suicide. And as we know, the two groups that commit suicide uh, the most uh, per capita are European Americans and American Indians. Infant mortality rates among African Americans are about double that of European Americans, and these differences also hold for those African Americans who are highly educated, as odd as that may seem. Hypertension is especially high among African American men, and unlike other health outcomes, hypertension rates are slightly higher for African American men with college degrees 
than they are for African American men with less education. The opposite holds true for African American women and for European uh, American uh, men and women. So if you're a highly educated uh, college graduate African American man, your your blood pressure is higher and you're more likely to die from hypertension. Compared to European Americans, Latinos tend to have lower mortality rates for 10 of the 15 leading causes of death. This ethnic difference is all the, the more puzzling because Latinos tend to be of lower socioeconomic status than the European Americans and hence should be expected to suffer worse health outcomes. And this is known as an epidemiological paradox. The epidemiological paradox does not apply equally to all groups of, of Latinos. Uh, Puerto Ricans do not show some, uh, some of the same unexplained health benefits as Mexicans and there are no explanations why. Latinos tend to be less likely to drink and smoke than non-Latinos, although they, are, they also tend to exercise less. The longer they have lived in the United States, the more likely they are to engage in unhealthy behaviors as they come to drink more, uh, smoke more, and are more likely to become obese and eat large pieces of pizza. <laughs> Uh, some cultural factors are more pronounced among Latinos, such as the high uh, value placed on childbearing and a good deal of emotional support provided by the community seem to provide an important health buffer. Uh, Latinos derive health uh, benefits from cultural scripts, uh, such as simpatica, and their unusually high levels of positive effect. In other words, they feel more uh, positive about life uh, than the European Americans tend to, to uh, feel. Uh, in traditional non-Western societies, beliefs in the supernatural causes of illness are widespread. Uh, these range from theories that aggressive spirits such as ghosts cause disease, which is the most widespread theory of disease, to accounts of witchcraft, sorcery, mystical retributions, and sinful violations of taboos. Among the Azande of uh, West Africa, uh, the primary cause of illness is attributed to witchcraft. Some Zande are believed to be witches, and the source of their witchcraft is believed to be a small organ in their bodies, which can be inherited from their parents. Uh, this is a, an Azande uh, girl. Uh, look, in her, look in her eyes. <laughs> uh, and there you go once again. The Zande witches uh, do not perform any rites, use any potions, or cast any spells, Rather, witches conduct their witchcraft entirely through their minds. When a Zande uh, develops a slowly progressing illness, it is believed to be the result of a witch who is consuming the soul of its victim's organs a little bit at a time. When a Zande develops a sudden acute illness, it is believed to be the result of a sorcerer casting a spell on them. In traditional Chinese medicine, a healthy body is one in which the dialectical forces of yin and yang are in balance. Any imbalances are believed to be ultimately to ultimately lead to illness. Balance. So they're talking about the same thing you guys talk about. Balance between nature and yourself. A person who has liver fire will have symptoms such as headaches, flush. We're talking about China again. Um, a person who has liver fire uh, will have symptoms such as headaches, flushed face, and anger, and this illness is believed to be caused by having too much yang and not enough yin. Uh, such an imbalance can be corrected by acupuncture, herbal remedies, exercise, diet, and lifestyle. Western doctors often disagree with one another. There are rather striking differences between medical practices of French and American doctors. French believe in the concept of terrain, or balance. This emphasis on balance shifts drug con consumption away from antibiotics and toward various tonics and vitamins that are believed to strengthen the immune system. Long rests and spa visits are also viewed as an important part of the lifestyle that rejuvenates the terrain. Hospital stays are relatively long in France, about double the length in the United States, for the same procedures to provide ample time for recuperation. Uh, okay, uh, one of the things they do is bring in clowns uh, 
to entertain people, to make them smile, to make them feel better. And this is a clown in in France who goes through the ward and does her little strange dance and makes people smile. And they they feel that this helps people recuperate, helps them recover. Uh, in the United States, a lot of people die in hospitals, and the reason they die in hospitals is for one reason, uh, is because <laughs> is because they send them there when they're about to die. But the other reason uh, that people die in hospitals is because it's such a depressing place in American hospitals. Of course, in France, you get to see the the uh, clown come through every day. Uh, when Europeans first came to the Americas, the natives often commented on how badly they smelled. This is because the common medical practice in the 17th century in France stated that bodily secretions offered a layer of protection, so it was considered unhealthy to bathe frequently. In 19, a 1976 article in Le Monde uh, stated that the French uh, hospital patient had the right to a monthly bath and a weekly foot uh, to weekly foot washings. French dermatologists recommend that people, even those with oily hair, not wash their hair more uh, than uh, once a week because doing so causes a greater amount of oil to be secreted. And that is how they feel in France. So if you ever watch a French movie, you may notice uh, that the French actors have greasy hair. And the reason is because they only wash their hair once a week. And they don't bathe that frequently. So if you've ever been around a French tourist, uh, you may have, have uh, detected a, uh, a negative body odor. Whoops, went the wrong way. The metaphor used in the United States by doctors is that the body is like a machine that needs to be tended to regularly to ensure that it is running well. When there are problems with, uh, with the body, it is often treated in ways that you might expect to see a machine repaired. U.S. medicine is known as the most aggressive in the world. Surgical procedures are used far more in the United States than in other countries where malfunctioning parts are removed, replaced, and or physically altered. Sounds like you're working on your car. U.S. doctors are more likely than European doctors to use surgery rather than drugs, but when drugs are prescribed in the United States, they are prescribed at higher dosages than any other country. It is rare in the United States for a doctor to prescribe rest and relaxation as a curative agent. Uh, one of the interesting things that has happened since I left medicine, uh, in the 2000s I was working in a uh, clinic in um, uh, Washington, D.C., a pediatrics clinic. And the AMA came out in 2001 and said that what they wanted to happen now, we weren't, uh, we weren't controlling pain well enough. So they decided that they needed to be more aggressive at dealing with pain. Uh, there were too pe many people in the United States with back pain, with uh, chronic pains, and we needed to do something about that. So they, uh, the AMA decided that they would increase the amount of opiates and opioids that were being used uh, to control pain. Uh, they needed to increase these. They needed to give people more of them. Uh, they needed to increase the dosage so that they were in less pain. Uh, the amount of pain hasn't really redu been reduced. But the amount of opiates and opioids on the streets has increased markedly, and that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons why we're having an opiate opioid uh, crisis right now, is because in 2000 2001 the AMA decided that we needed better pain control, and obviously it was a mistake. U.S. doctors tend to search for external causes of illness, such as bacteria and viruses. U.S. doctors pres prescribe more antibiotics than doctors from el uh, elsewhere. And Americans tend to have a greater concern for cleanliness and attempt to avoid contact with germs. And that may be a mistake as well, because uh, it's actually the, the uh, germs that can protect you. Uh, the, an anti uh, a an environment that has no germs, uh, you don't develop an immune system that can fight off germs and viruses. Uh, I'm not saying that you should live in a dirty environment. What I'm saying is we live in too uh, sterile an environment, and because of the sterility, uh, we are not 
allowing our children to become immune to select diseases. And uh, that is the end of the chapter. And there you go. Sorry about all the stories. Uh, I'll talk to you next week. Next week's the last week. This is week 13, actually. Uh, there's only one more chapter uh, that we have to deal with, so there's only one more lecture. And then uh, you can catch up and, and send me your paper. Um, one of the things about your paper, uh, I want you to talk about uh, your culture and, and a culture that you don't know about, a culture that's alien to you. It can be another tribe. It can be uh, uh, an overseas culture. Uh, it can be anything except the dominant uh, white American culture, which is a myth anyway. But uh, uh, we, what I want you to do is research another culture. Uh, one of the things that may happen to you if you become a counselor is that uh, wh while you are counseling, you may come in contact with somebody who's not a Navajo. And if that is what happens to you, then you're going to have to understand that person from their cultural perspective. Uh, so you're going to potentially have to do um, some research to discover what's going on as far as that person's mindset is concerned. Uh, and so I want you to, to understand that there are other people in the world who have different, uh, different ideas than, uh, than the Diné people. Uh, so uh, that's, that is your mission, is to find a book or to find a book that deals with another culture. Uh, I, ha I can give you suggestions if you need suggestions. Um, I have a whole stack of books over here dealing with uh, cultures other than the Diné culture. I have a whole stack of books over here dealing with the Diné culture. As a matter of fact, right now I'm reading a book called The Scalpel and the Sil Silver Bear. Uh, the first Navajo woman surgeon combines Western medicine and traditional healing. Uh, really fascinating so far. I'm on page 86. Uh, I'll get through that eventually, but right now I'm reading papers <laughs> and doing a lot of grading uh, and advising. So if you, if anybody needs any help with their with advising, uh, you can uh, talk to uh, uh, what's his name Dominguez. Last name Dominguez. First name Calvin. Calvin Dominguez. You can talk to Calvin Dominguez. You can talk to uh, Dr. Russ. You can talk to Professor Barber. You can talk to me. You can talk to uh, Dr. Dr. Begay. But you, you have to understand Dr. Begay is really busy, so uh, it may be difficult for her. Uh, for her, I, I would go to the other three of us. Uh, she's she's actually trying to put together a. Um, uh, uh, she's trying to get, put together a curriculum that uh, deals with uh, that supports. Uh, the uh, traditional uh, psychology of, uh, of the Diné people. Um, real important. Uh, so uh, pick, on, pick on the other three of us, or Calvin, uh, Dr. Russ, Professor Barber, or myself, uh, and we will help you uh, with advising. Uh, Tara uh, Lamont Harvey is no longer uh, working uh, as she did before. She's now working for the provost. Uh, she's not advising in, in our department anymore. So we will have to do the, the, the advising. So if you need, um, you've got my uh, uh, Zoom uh, address for uh, office hours. Um, email me. I'll be glad to help you in any way I possibly can. Uh, so I'll talk to you next week.